Since 1998, George's EMC security has flown high by delivering sterling customer service without the safety net of long-term contracts. In this podcast, the company's leadership discusses the firm's unique model, success formula, and expansive portfolio. Be sure to subscribe to SSI's YouTube channel. Hit the like button, share, and leave comments. Or subscribe to SSI's Security Speaking Podcast on Apple and Spotify. And leave us a review. Thank you. See, the company protects, um, you know, 16 school systems in Georgia. And uh, how, how did you manage through the the, the pandemic and COVID, uh, you know, closing some of these uh, commercial locations and, and schools? I mean, I imagine that, uh, you know, slowed your anticipated uh, penetration and activity on the commercial side. Yeah, it did. Uh, 2019, we had... Um, one of our best years ever and uh, commercial had e- extreme growth from prior years. And then of course, in 2020, it, it was a different story for us. A lot of those commercial uh, customers put things on hold, projects on hold. Um, you know, they, they were not even open for business or they had sent everybody home. Uh, we had challenges as well. I mean, our, our, our employees were nervous about being in the field, both on the sales and the installation service side. We had to deploy um, most of our uh, office staff uh, to home uh, and work with the skeleton staff here. It was, a, it was a real challenge. Of course, we all know about the uh, supply chain issues that uh, resulted. So it was, a, it was a tough year and a half. Um, but as Michael mentioned, it, it did bounce back. And, uh, you know, we were seeing you know, tremendous growth since then. Uh, I think we did very well in surviving the, the, the whole uh, pandemic uh, as far as customer care. Uh, and we, we, like everyone, we spent a lot of money on PPE. We, you know, talked to our customers continuously. We added a lot of technologies here at the office, such as uh, uh, cloud-hosted phone systems and uh, VPNs for secure access to customer database information. We deployed uh, some some new technology in the field that Chuck uh, de- helped us deploy, uh, and all that. We we I think we survived very well. And just continuing with the supply chain aspect, um, you know, how's that looking right now? Uh, what do you anticipate for the rest of uh, 2022 and into 2023 regarding that? Sean, you want to speak to that? Uh, currently, we are experiencing s- some supply chain issues. Um, we're, we're diverse in our residential uh, delivery, so we, we've got we've we've played through the radio swapping transition over the last three years. We, we saw some some of that supply chain issue, so I think it prepped us as far as preparing uh, for for different uh, options to offer customers, as far as whether it be radios or. Or, you know, we're having issues now with smoke, getting smoke detectors or wireless transmitters. We've kind of prepared for that. We, we have a jam up staff in our warehouse that, that keeps us abreast of what we're seeing coming forward. And, and we order as we need to order. You know, we've, we've probably, we, we had some aches and pains for sure uh, on the residential side. I'd let Gene speak more on the commercial side, but I, th- I think through preparation and, ha- and having multiple um, offers, We've kind of come through it, you know, but I wouldn't say we're out of the woods because, like I said, there are still still some offers out there that we struggle to get. But um, we're trying to stay on top of it the best we can. I think we've done an outstanding job of it. Uh, but the radios really helped us kind of prepare for for the upcoming future, you know, because we dealt with that probably a year ago to a year and a half ago to really start seeing that that issue. And so we kind of kind of learned our lesson real quick to to plan ahead on on the, on the on the equipment side. Yeah, so one of the things that um, Vince allowed us to do um, was to order the inventory early uh, and hold in the warehouse. So um, a lot of companies, if you have a cash flow problem, can't because you're 30 days net with your suppliers, couldn't order early. They have to wait till actually the schedule of values of the project, but then you're a year out to get the equipment. So Vince allowed me to pre-order the equipment as, uh, uh, for the contracts that we had in hand. 
even though those were going to be delivered six months to eight months later. Uh, and that really was a, a suspense moved on his part to allow us to do that um, because everybody else to put orders in later got even further pushed out and especially destruction, you have to seal the building. So it's very imperative that, especially for fire alarm, that you have the equipment for those deliverables and receivables because without that, you're not bringing in revenue. Yes, Scott, we added uh, uh, over a million dollars of inventory uh, to our existing levels, and we were already a, a, a pretty large carrier of, of inventory. Um, matter of fact, if you'll see in the notes, we're building additional warehouse space right now. It's under construction. Um, but that's, that's something that, that we, we have always done. We want to have the materials on hand when we need them. So we, we probably carry more inventory uh, than, than most uh, companies because and we, we have the ability to do that because we've been prudent with uh, uh, you know managing cash flow and, and managing debt level. Um, I, I think we we have to 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 recognize the fact that we we replaced twenty seven thousand radios during uh, the the, uh, the 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 period when the the three G four G went away and John Reeves handled that uh, on behalf of the company he and his staff and we managed to replace all but a few hundred now. We're down to our last few hundred. Um, and we did that without charging customers uh, on the residential side. We did charge commercial customers a nominal fee, but uh, that was a significant investment that this company made in our customers to, to, uh, to say that we are going to install, you know, upgraded radios in every single home we had an active customer. It's probably a three million dollar company investment overall, and you think about that. We we did that without our customers even having a contract for long term service with us. So I don't I don't think you'll see that kind of commitment in most companies to their existing customers. Hmm. Are you offering managed or hosted services or cloud based? subscription type services on the commercial side at all? Yes. And uh, that's one of the things that's been mentioned on the, the video side, even with analytics, without tying it into some sort of interface when they're uh, in the building and not in the building, uh, friend or foe, um, that's still a challenge today. Um, corner, corner offices, you know, excess traffic at night. So the, the business is, is definitely going that way. We also have cloud-based access control um, and host services in that regard, that's uh, per reader that's going, that's the next wave is um, moving from um, CapEx to OpEx for a lot of companies to, to manage their cash flow. What is the sort of uh, company philosophy in terms of cultivating recurring revenue versus project-based, you know? Are you trying to attach some element of recurring to every new sale now, or how are you looking at that? On the commercial side, everything is set up to where obviously I need profitability and it's core of the project day one. So it's, it's not a ROI of time. Um, the secondary uh, RMR is uh, maintenance contracts, as well as the monitoring of both fire and um, moving to the cloud-based charges after an hour of, of remote service. And, and <clears throat> excuse me, what, what are you using for remote service and troubleshooting, things like that, to avoid uh, having to roll trucks perhaps as much as in the past? So, so we hired a uh, IT uh, cloud-based services um, engineer uh, that sits uh, in our, our uh, monitoring station uh, and takes those calls, interfaces both with our clients and our technicians in the field. Uh, and that's been very supportive um, of instantly helping our clients for uh, any immediate needs. And to what extent are you touching both uh, residential and commercial networks in terms of, uh, you know, setting those up, um, servicing those, uh, health monitoring the networks? Are you, are you doing some of that? So we're doing that on the um, Dell server side. Part of our Vigilant platform is, is Dell. Um, so we, we can provide a, a 
health check that's proactive emailing, you know, overheating, you know, it'll send us an email. Um, but also many of our commercial folks have IT folks that are already engaged with the, the upgrades and the connectivity and, and the health and say they communicate to us and we actually dial in uh, to the equipment while they're there on site to, to take a look at that. And then if we need to roll a truck, if it's not within their purview, especially our school districts uh, and, and larger accounts, again, they're, they're proactively working on the actual servers for both video and access control that we support. It's one thing to kind of throw everything against the wall and see what sticks, but you know, you got to commit to every offering and follow it through and have the right support and the right marketing and all that kind of thing. So uh, there's a lot more to it than just saying, oh yeah, we offer this. Yeah, and that's one of the challenges from residential to commercial is one of the things Vint understood, it's not the same people operationally to deliver to the client. A commercial client and the technical requirements needed um, is, is uniquely different than a wireless uh, burglar alarm. And those are different people technically, you know, trained years of training. Uh, Vince understood that, and that's why we do so well, both in our deliverables and need both sides. And, and that's why we created, the, you know, the divisions the way they are, you know, uh, and, and there is a lot of uh, uh, crosstalk between the two. We share resources, we share support. John's group um, uh, in the operations center can handle all the calls from whether it's a residential or uh, mid-sized commercial or large integrated commercial, but we know where to hand it off to get the right people out there and the right solution. Uh, Scott, it has been a challenge though to try to communicate to potential customers across all those different uh, offers. Uh, Gene is uh, when he first came, he he said, you know, I don't. We run into people all the time that never knew that we do commercial because we were so recognized as a um, you know, strong residential uh, uh, services provider, they didn't think about us for uh, large integrated fire systems or video systems. Um, you know, we're a notifier dealer. They didn't know that. Uh, they thought, you know, if they needed fire, they had to go somewhere else. So, and that's one of the challenges for Michael uh, in his uh, department and, and with Jennifer to be able to communicate that, that we do all of these things, we do them well, and uh, we, we can do them efficiently and cost effectively for the customer. Because as you said, there's, it, it's not easy to be that wide spectrum of product lines and do it well and deliver on it. And we have to deliver on it. Uh, we, you know, we're owned by companies that have very, very high standards for customer service delivery. And we do not, we do not have contracts for our customers. When I say no contracts, no long-term contract. Uh, that hold them if uh, if we make a mistake. So we have to make sure that every interaction means something to the customer and it is uh, shows that we're a valuable asset for them. Well, when you talk about that A++ service, you know, so much of that uh, ties back to, you know, having the right uh, company culture. Um, you have to have that from within to, to give it outward. So um, I had seen that, uh, you know, 27 employees have been with EMC security for 10 years or more. Uh, very impressive, especially in the job market today and, and how challenging it is for, for everybody. So um, can you speak a little bit to the company culture and uh, sort of what makes it um, a place that people want to, um, you know, make a career out of and, you know, how it flows through the organization? Yeah, I'll start that off, Scott, and then others can join in. Um, I think we have a, a very unique culture. You know, we're a local company. Uh, we serve North Georgia primarily. Uh, so we do attract people that, uh, you know, uh, want to work at, a, a, at a, a company that's local, but that has, you know, good compensation packages, great benefits. And we have all that. Um, but we also have a, a culture that promotes from within. Um, I, I think I uh, talked about that a little in the, um, quest, the Q&A. Uh, a number of our key people, that a lot of them are participating today, did not start um, in, in, either in the industry at all, or they didn't start at the level they started. They started in uh, uh, sales. They started in 
installation. They started in various parts of the business and we've given them opportunities uh, to grow and to uh, uh, you know, take on a, a much larger role uh, and, and uh, really make a difference with the company. And I think that's a good part of why people stay with us. They see that, that there's a path and if they're the right kind of person and they, they um, have the skill sets that we need and they work hard, they can, they can advance uh, and move up in the company and, and become a part of a, you know, a key direction team uh, for this company. And of course, we, we pay well, we uh, have great benefits. We have a lot of fun here. Um, we've got, you know, I, I mentioned our 401k plan that matches 100% to 4% of the, of the uh, contribution uh, vested from day one. You know, we do an end of the year distribution every year where we uh, take part of the company uh, profits and we return those back to our employees. Uh, we do regular reviews and we try to make sure that we pay out or above market for the, for the job. Um, and that, that keeps people loyal. If you recognize them, you promote them, you pay them, and, uh, and it's a good place to work and you have fun. Um, that's, that's the kind of culture that, that I think we work really hard to, to keep. Um, our, our, I think our employees know that we have an open door policy. All the managers are right here. We're not spread across the country. My door's open every day. Michael's you know, John Chucks, you can walk into any office here and talk to the managers if you have a concern or a problem. And uh, I think that's a big part of our culture as well. Anybody else want to add to that? Yeah, I want to add something. Um, what's been said is, is very true. Um, but, and not that, and I would add that We've had employees here that have come that have been here for 30 days or 60 days that have come to me and said that they how impressed they are with how we always strive to do the right thing for the customer. And and we have people coming from other companies that are new. They used to work with a competitor and they're not amazed, but they're very impressed with how we handle ourselves in front of the customer. We always strive to do the right thing for the customer. And I'll admit sometimes it's not good for us. We're, we lose out on that end a lot of times, but we know that we have to do what's right for that customer. And when I said earlier that we walk the walk, we really do. And that's very impressive to the people that work there, that you know that the company works every day in a place of integrity. And um, it's really nice to be here. It's very easy to be here because everybody has one goal in mind and that's you know, taking care of the customer while in the business at the same time. I'll, I'll just add to that, Scott, one, one small piece that, that was in the, the write-up that Vince sent you, but um, it, it, it helps me sort of calibrate when I, when I reflect on not only my career, but those of my, my uh, employees, people that work for me. We, we conduct annual reviews for, for every employee in the company. We sit down with that employee, uh, the, the manager and the employee will sit down and there's prep work that goes into the annual review, both on the employees and, and the manager's end to, to reflect back on the prior year and, and cover several points. What, what did I accomplish in the last year? What have I done for my own personal growth or growth within the organization? Uh, what do I need to to do to continue to develop both personally and as an employee? And then what are my career interests? And, and those, those four things help to sort of define, uh, was I successful over the last year? Am I going in the right direction? And uh, I remember early on in, in my career here doing that with, with Vince. And uh, probably for the first 10 years, I, I, would put on my review that I, I can't believe you let me do the things that I do here. I'm not qualified to, to make the decisions that you're letting me make. I've never done it before, but that's one of the great things about the organization is we, we allow people to grow. We, we let them stretch their wings a little bit. We let them try new things. And that keeps people excited about being here. Uh, if it was the same thing every day, uh, it gets rote and, and we don't want people to, 
not be excited to come to work. We want them to look forward to it and, and wonder, you know, what will my career look like a year from now? I think that's especially critical with, you know, new young people coming in because so many, you know, don't have necessarily a strong security background. They come from, you know, other uh, areas and to, to, you know, bring good people into this industry. I think that kind of approach is very important. So kudos. Um, I, don't think, uh, I don't think anybody's hired more people than John in the last, uh, you know, year or two with, with the radio replacements, with uh, uh, growing uh, base of customers and most of those come from other companies do you want to you know add anything john that you you've heard from why people chose us and why they stay with us versus what they had with uh culture is a big word for me as well scott i think um i think culture comes from leading with sincerity and integrity and i think i think people that i've brought in from other companies they like to support, you know, they, they get a different level of support from, from our staff, the management staff, the, the inside tech support staff, uh, the, the data entry teams that we have set up. It's just layered appropriately, if that makes sense. But I, I think, I think people, I think they look for integrity and I think they look for sincerity. And I, I think that's how you leave. And that, I think that, I think that impresses people. I, th I think we've had luck with it, uh, with bringing in, uh, that's that's the most um, compelling thing I've heard at, from time and time again from bringing people in from other organizations. It's the support and, and the integrity and the sincerity that we operate with. It's, I think it's how you lead, and I think that's what sticks out to me. Very good. Thank you. Continuing with, um, you know, the sort of landscape where you're based, um, looking up on Google, it looks like you're headquarters are about 34 miles outside of Atlanta. Uh, was that still considered suburban Atlanta or is it kind of beyond that? It's, it's, it's suburban, but it, you know, Atlanta, like a lot of large cities have, have a sprawl. They, people live and work all over. Um, we, we cover a huge geographic area, even though we're a local company, meaning, you know, the North Georgia area. Uh, when you look at our service territory all the way from the North Georgia mountains all the way into middle Georgia, uh, and uh, it's a large service territory. So we cover uh, downtown Atlanta uh, as well as suburban markets, as well as a lot of rural areas. So uh, our guys do spend a lot of uh, time with uh, windshield time. We try to hire so that we cover you know, geographic areas. And we're, we want to be efficient on how we dispatch um, our install and service teams. We have remote warehouses set up, Scott, um, in multiple locations. And we have team leaders in each one of these areas uh, because it, it's a big area to cover. So but there's a lot of growth in, in a lot of these uh, cities around Atlanta. It's not just the city of Atlanta that's growing. You know, all the respective uh, counties and cities that support Atlanta and uh, are growing as well. And it's uh, highly competitive in the security area, although there's been some you know, interesting uh, M&A activity in that area uh, of late. Can you speak to the you know, overall competitive environment? How intense is it? And you know, I know you've spoken to a lot of um, differentiation points that EMC brings to the, to the table. Uh, but maybe you could just elaborate on that a little bit more in terms of, you know, up against this intense competition. Michael, that's custom made for you and Jennifer to answer. You have to be the ones who have to generate the revenue and, and um, find the customers. Yeah, it's it's a hotbed, Scott. I mean, we we are ground zero for for new new product launches, new company launches. Uh, you know, it's it's not uncommon for us to to hear about a new competitor. You know, monthly, uh, we 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 talked about one a week and a half ago that that first time we've ever heard their name, and and they are uh, have big plans for the Atlanta market. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of ways to to skin the the cat on on residential security. Uh, you know length of, of contract, monthly rate, upfront cost. 
and there's there's different variations on each one of those. Um, what what we are confident in is our ability to deliver uh, really excellent experience for our customers. So although we do review those competitive entrants and, and we do respond to them and we look to to make sure we're sort of sharpening our sword with with every every one, um, you know, we, we haven't we haven't faced one yet that uh, was was so uh, different or or scary that that we felt like we needed to make a, a holistic change to our offering. Um, that may be coming. I mean, the technology is changing so quickly, and, and what companies are willing to do is is changing. But uh, it remains extraordinarily competitive uh, for the for the very um, very finite number of customers that are in the North Georgia market. Uh, I wish uh, I wish people that were looking at Georgia would look elsewhere because it it is it is tight um but we're um uh, we're committed to continuing to serve our customers with with honesty and in and, uh, and ethics that um you know luckily not all of our competitors have so we we think that uh, that's going to win the day and continue to win the day you know, you know scott we often wonder if if uh new entrants to the business are growing faster than the available market share. Um, I have never seen in the last five years, maybe seven years, so many new players and, and very large uh, players, you know, well-funded uh, technology companies that are entering the space and, um, you know, all making promises, all, uh, um, you know, it helps with the visibility, and we 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 do like that. Uh, but at the same time, it, we have to wonder whether or not there is a, enough market sp uh, to for all the new players and the existing players uh, to thrive and grow. And I think that's why we're all seeing a lot of M um, and A activities you mentioned, and a lot of uh, people wanting to exit the business uh, or change their business and, and migrate from residential to commercial or expand their uh, bundle of services to include solar and so many other things is, you know, there are only so many customers, even though it is growing, it's, is it growing as fast as the, uh, as the new entrants? So I, I don't know what you've heard. Uh, you talk to companies every day, so. Well, you know, I mean, still, when you look at the total penetration, especially uh, residentially, even if commercial is growing better right now, um, you know, it's still the majority of, of people don't have systems, right? So, I yeah. mean, there's all that opportunity uh, potentially. And as, you know, all the services expand and, and, and things like that, um, there's more and more offerings to help make that penetration. So I find it very exciting. And I think there's still so much opportunity out there. Um, I got a couple more minutes here. I want to try to get uh, maybe uh, two more questions in, if that's good with everybody. Um, one is, um, you know, when you talk about uh, all those radios that you deployed, a lot of cases uh, at no cost to the customer and the supply chain issues and everything else going on, you know, what are some ways that you're, um, you know, trying to, or succeeding in maintaining uh, margins? Um, you know, how much are you raising prices to customers, if at all? And how are you navigating through this uh, inflationary period? Yeah, great, great uh, question, great challenge. Um, you know, Chuck, do you want to, um, yeah, you know, nobody some, follows the financials more closely. Yeah, some of the things are, you know, with uh, COVID, you know, we did um, have a reduction in workforce, just basically nothing that we had to do, just people left or tried to find other work or for whatever reason. So our actually our uh, number of employees that we had uh, dropped. But one thing we've tried to do is to increase our, our productivity here. And in doing that and having technology, like Ben said about the rollout for our Work work process now is fully automated. It's uh, and that goes along also with all of our um, 
receiving payments uh, to the customers is all automated. So a lot of things we've tried to do here is to uh, have better practices and better automation to be able to pull down expenses uh, from that standpoint. So it's always a matter of you know trying to um, you, know, you want to increase revenue and decrease expenses. So we've been kind of going uh, both ways, but on the expense side, we've been trying to do things that will help us be more efficient and therefore we're able to um, reduce our costs. You know, Scott, we, we did increase um, on both commercial and residential our uh, service rates. We, we were probably too low on those for many years, uh, but we did try to, to augment that or offset that by you know, trying to do more for the customer either on the phone through download so they wouldn't have to have a on-site service call. But that that uh, price did go up. Um, we we stopped discounting as much. Uh, I will tell you, we uh, there, during the course of, uh, you know, adding new customers here over the years, uh, I think we got a little carried away with uh, the discounting equipment that we didn't have to do. Matter of fact, when we stopped doing some of the discounts, we didn't see a real change in our, <clears throat> excuse me, our customer acquisition. So maybe maybe that wasn't necessary. Our base rate of monitoring has not changed in 24 years. Uh, we've we've offered 16.95 base monitoring rate for uh, landline connected or internet connected uh, systems, and has not changed in 24 years. There was a, a, a little bit of adjustment for cell services, but it actually, we reduced it years ago and we just put it back to where it was. So I don't know if you call that a price increase or if you just call that uh, you know, reverting back to the original price. But I think we're more cautious about uh, you know, discounting and that kind of thing. And as Chuck mentioned, automation, you know, going paperless, better scheduling, uh, quicker and more nimble scheduling. Instead of people traveling all around, we now uh, try to keep people in their areas for sales and install. Uh, anything else that you can think of, John, that just no, makes us more efficient? Those are the big hitters. I mean, it's keeping the eye on your businesses. It's, it's, and we've still got ways to go. You know, that's the exciting part of it, really, when he speaks of scheduling, we're constantly looking for ways to improve and tweak and, and, and it's just keeping the eye on efficiency. You know, years and years of holding uh, expenses down. We we purchased our building years and years ago, uh, so we were you know that's a fixed cost for us. Uh, we uh, are very careful about adding things that don't add value to the customer transaction or to the customer experience. Uh, having no debt that's just been huge for us. I mean, we saw a recent a, a recent spectacular. Uh, you know, display of that when one of our major competitors uh, that had acquired a lot of debt over the years, um, you know, was uh, almost forced a sale of their of their customer base and their assets. And, um, you know, we have not had to deal with that because we've not acquired so much debt over the years and just been very prudent. And that helps keep our costs low and that helps keep our margins in line. You noted uh, growing demand for interactive services. What does that look like for EMC security and uh, where do you see that uh, heading in the near future? Michael, you wanna take that one? Sure. Um, yeah, we, we, uh, we were early adopters of, of interactive services back when alarm.com uh, came out in, in 06. We uh, thought that was gonna be, be huge. Uh, and and it, and it has been. Uh, it, I don't think it it grew quite as rapidly as a lot of people thought it would, um, but it is a, a mainstay now. It's almost expected at this point that if you buy any technology whatsoever, there's there's an app and there's controls and um, and it's a, a very easy tie-in for for our salespeople to to include that. Um, I think the the challenge for us on on interactive services is is really kind of making sure that we're congruent 
with the customer and their expectations of what interactive services means. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing customers that that expect um, every, you know, any security system whatsoever is going to have a camera attached to it. That, that's their idea of security. So um, is, is controlling or viewing a camera considered interactive? Is that their definition of interactive? Uh, is, is it uh, just controlling the security system or is it controlling home automation uh, components, lights, locks, and thermostats? I, I think defining the, the interactive services is the greatest challenge for our, our salespeople um, because the, the customer is being told all kinds of things in the marketplace. Uh, you know, they, they go to, to Lowe's and they're told interactive services uh, is, a, is a door lock with an app. Uh, and they expect that from their security company. And, and we, as an industry, have to uh, help define that and, and be sort of the leader in that discussion rather than letting the, the uh, uh, doorbell manufacturers or door lock manufacturers or thermostat manufacturers define what that means to our customers. Um, so, you know, I, I do think that it's... Uh, going to continue to be a larger part of, of every security company's offering. Um, I think the last, uh, last month's report showed that almost 80% of our new customers uh, had, had an interactive component to their system, which is the highest it's ever been for us. Um, our, our current uh, customer database is, is not, not that high. So we see opportunities there to, for Jennifer to continue to talk to our customers and, and get those people brought over. Um, so it, it, it's exciting. It's just a little worrisome that we may not be speaking the same language as our customers when they talk about interactive and what it is to them. My last question that, that I have uh, is, you know, how is uh, the outlook for 2023? What are you anticipating? What are you looking forward to? I just want to say, uh, uh, Scott, that I think one of the challenges the industry has and that we have when we, as Michael said, define smart home, set parameters for how things are going to work, how do cameras work, what's the expectation. Uh, I have to say that um, some of our uh, competitors in the marketplace that are doing these um, advertising uh, on television and, and uh, that show what they almost ridiculous capabilities of these systems. And I won't mention any names, but, you know, a company comes to mind where the intruders outside of a house looking at a window and a camera sees, sees them. And within seconds, he's being hauled away by the police. And, um, you know, I, I think that sets customers expectations for how smart systems and video systems work and, it's you know, we, we know that that's, you know, and, and so our salespeople have to set reasonable parameters for what the customer's expectations will be. And I think that's going to be a big part of the, uh, the coming environment is who can set realistic expectations for the customer experience, meet those customer experiences, and, uh, and not end up with disappointed customers or over-promising and under-delivering. It's it's a fine line, and I again I don't know where we're going with that, but that's something that we talk about and work on every day. Yeah, because you got basically you got Bluetooth technology, near field communication technology, Wi-Fi, and true cloud based on your cellular. So back to Vince's point is you have a lot five things that are considered interactive. I can open the door with a Bluetooth reader credential. That's is that interactive? I can go Wi-Fi, but if I'm out of my Wi-Fi range, you can't control my system. Oh, so again, back to the whole, what what does interactive mean without it being spelled out for the client um, value add? Um, could we have a disappointed client? I think that we need to fix that in our industry. Even yeah, now, I, I, I agree totally. And now we're seeing that with uh, artificial intelligence too. You know, what is actually... AI, everyone's saying this has AI involved and Correct. there's so many different levels and layers of that. And um, yes, managing those customer expectations, especially with what they hear 
or they see those overstated ads and marketing, or they see stuff on TV and they think it's, you know, so that's definitely a huge challenge, especially when you want to, um, you know, always over deliver. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I totally uh, em empathize with that. So for the final question, 2023, as we look forward, uh, what are you anticipating um, and, and why? Well, I think we'll see uh, continuous growth in our commercial division. Uh, it just, it, it, it seems to, to be doing extremely well. Um, larger and larger projects, uh, key projects. We've landed uh, some really important key uh, uh, pro projects there. Uh, multifamily continues to grow. Uh, we're, we're good at it. We've been doing it a long time and we're a recognized player there. Uh, we are going to continue to grow the residential business, um, but it's, it's harder. Uh, it, it certainly uh, it may cost us a little more to acquire uh, significant more customers, uh, but we do have plans to continue to grow that ahead of attrition. Uh, we're going to, as Michael mentioned, we have a huge opportunity to be able to, to uh, touch our existing customer base of 60,000 plus customers and introduce them to technologies either they haven't been paying attention to, smart home technologies, connected technologies, or they've just been slow in adopting those. So I think our average RMR is gonna to continue to, to increase. Um, anything else, Michael? Uh, you know, technologies changes so quickly. We're, we're always excited to see what our manufacturing partners are gonna bring. Uh, in terms of advancement and, and eye popping, eye catching, exciting things for our end users. So um, we're, of course, we work diligently with, with our uh, manufacturing partners to give our uh, sort of the voice of the customer and, and tell them what we're hearing and seeing. Um, and we've got great partners that, that listen to that and take action. So, um, well, I think we'll see some, some exciting technology advancements next year. And, uh, and hopefully we'll be early enough to the party that, that we can capitalize on it with our, our customer base. We would like to continue to expand our, our partnerships with other EMCs uh, so we can do geographic expansion. That's, that's always um, a part of our discussions. Um, and we've had some interest. Yeah, so we see that as a, a continued part of our plan. Uh, and you know, I, I think that we'll like we'll keep our eyes open for opportunities. You know, we're not quite as, as maybe bullish as some of the other companies are at adding things like solar or um, adding things that, that are a bolt on to the security platform or the home automation platform. Uh, but that's a possibility. I mean, we're going to explore things that make sense for us and that can cost effectively uh, be brought to the customer and that we're not going to have to uh, uh, to really get too highly leveraged in order to be able to uh, uh, offer our customers. And on the commercial side, basically, we're adding more accoutrements such as gates, fencing, other things. If you think about uh, full site protection in its layered approach, um, from a commercial perspective, every client's requesting that now. And being a company that can offer that as a one-stop shop has been very valuable to us. Outstanding. Everybody, I really appreciate it. I wish you continued uh, success uh, moving forward. Thank you so much for spending time and sharing, you know, your business and all that you're doing there. I, I really appreciate it. So, Scott? Yes, Scott, thank you very Thanks. much for your time today.